Well, welcome along to the Gary Neville podcast. Gary and I are just catching our breath after a remarkable second half here at St James's Park where Newcastle have beaten Arsenal by a goal to nil. And it was a, a remarkable, well, a remarkable game, really, not in the first half in a footballing sense, but the way that the temperature of the game built up. Yeah, I like the game um, in the sense of the physicality of it and the, the struggle. I, I always feel that sometimes it's great to watch... Um, a good game for me is sometimes when both teams are struggling to score when the defences are on top and you can see the real compact nature of both teams the work that they've done on the training pitch and Arsenal have had a good defensive record this season Newcastle were good last year I think I've only conceded 11 this year so they're both still in pretty good shape defensively and they all work really hard so I think we're quick sometimes when we see a team that doesn't work hard to point that out. we should really sort of emphasise when two teams are, are really doing well defensively and like you say it was a game that I thought that I mean, it wasn't going anywhere first half. And I think Arsenal will have been really happy after half now because I always think when you come to St James's Park in this first 15, 20 minutes, the crowd are up, they come out really quick and they sort of quieten the crowd and they silence them and then all of a sudden that Kai Havertz challenge sort of just lit the spark the whole game, didn't it? And it, from there on in, became a bit feisty. There was that and the Bruno Gimaraes um, arm into the face of Jorginho. Where, where do you stand now at the end of the game, having looked at them again as to whether they uh, were yellows or reds? They both could have been red. Yeah, they both could have been red because I think they both knew they couldn't get there. They both weren't, in my view, playing the ball. Havertz, the ball had gone. I think he knew the ball had gone. And I'm not quite sure when you were ever allowed to forearm or elbow a player in the face on purpose. You know, it's really simple. You know, we see sometimes when players come to touch heads with each other and just one of them nods, for, nods their head forward, it's a sending off. If you go like that into someone's face on the way past with your forearm or your elbow, I, I think you're asking for a red card. So I think they were both lucky. I mean, the game benefited from it. I didn't want to see players get sent off. So it's not a case of, you know, I want to see more yellow cards, more red cards. But I just thought that they were both poor challenges for, you know, basically you know, unnecessary challenges and poor challenges. And then in the second half, I mean, have you ever known a goal like that which had three different VAR checks on it? No, and to be fair, I think at one point I said I'm done uh, because, I mean, we've got 30 cameras in the ground or something like that, and Newcastle have found a way to evade all 30 cameras on all three incidents. There was no conclusive evidence that the ball went out. There was obviously maybe conclusive evidence around the Joel Linton one, but even that, it was a bit of a struggle to see it in real time from the angles that we had. And then the offside... We got that through, didn't we, from Stockley Park, that there was no conclusive evidence that when the ball left Joel Linton's body and did he play it towards, obviously, to Anthony Gordon, they could have proved maybe that Anthony Gordon was in an offside position, but they couldn't prove the essential thing, which is the timing of the last touch on the player. So if they can't prove those things, then you end up with a situation where there's no conclusive evidence. And my gut feeling was that they were hanging around on the possible foul quite a lot. And there's an angle where it looks like a foul because Joel Linton's got both his arms out. But that, honestly, that's not a foul for me. You know, Gabriel's thrown himself forward. I've done it sometimes. When the ball's just a bit lower than your body, you go forward to try and flick it on. And that's what um, Gabriel's tried to do. I've tried to demonstrate that for you there. I hope you got it. Um, <laughs> he didn't have to do it with headphones on, yeah, though, did he, of course? I, I know what Gabriel's tried to do. And in the end, because he's thrown his arms back, Joel Linton's arms naturally come out like that. So for me, that isn't a foul just instinct of a defender and sort of I'm happy to stand up for defenders when I think they've been fouled as well so for me that wasn't a foul and the offside it was just mayhem and Stockley Park was stuck on it for quite a while and in the end yeah there's no conclusive evidence there's and I agree with them there's nothing that told me strongly enough that that wasn't a goal I mean I'm sure there'll be Arsenal fans watching saying it but the ball went out it was a foul and it was offside but honestly I'm looking at it neutrally I've got no sort of ambition to be an Arsenal fan or a Newcastle fan but one thing we should we must never do a Saturday night football again without a referee alongside us to be able to throw <laughs> to everything I think it was Spurs I did Spurs and Liverpool on a Saturday night a few weeks ago and that was madness from a from a VAR perspective this one tonight's been madness and sometimes you're just thinking where's Mike Dean gone he's gone missing on me yeah his shift on a Saturday isn't yeah. long enough he needs to work some overtime doesn't he yeah um You've seen Newcastle twice now in a week yeah. um, at a time where their squad is a bit stretched as well. Yeah. So bearing that in mind, how, how far do you think this pool of players that Eddie Howe has got can go? I think he's getting the absolute maximum out of them. I really do, and I have done for quite some time. Um, they're a very good team, very solid um, characters. 
they give everything on the pitch, they work as hard as any team in the league and that can be something you can always be really proud of. They've got decent quality, but they're not the best in the final third. They put pressure on teams in the final third, but they're not what would be sort of real difference maker players that you would sort of say if you put them into that team, but then do you lose something else? Do you lose that spirit? Do you lose the wage structure? Do you lose the actual bit that really is important to Newcastle fans, which is when they go out on that pitch, they fight for that badge. And that's this, this group of players do. And they know what actually a group of players that doesn't fight for the badge looks like because they've been there for 10 years before this change of ownership where it was pretty dismal. So I have to say at this moment in time, and I've said this actually for a couple of years, the ownership here obviously have got wealth but they've got a big decision to make at a certain point of when they try and transfer it from what would be really brilliant group of players with a fantastic manager, with a great spirit, that probably never going to win the Premier League as they are now and they're probably never going to win the Champions League and that's, that's the reality. So w at what point do they try and go for it and support Eddie Howe in bringing in what would be the players that might make the difference so that they can go win more big games like they've done today? It was a big moment for Newcastle today. I'm... I'm glad they won from a point of view of just, just what they put into the game. And I actually thought Arsenal put a lot into the game as well. But having watched them on Wednesday night at Old Trafford, they were fantastic there where they made seven or eight changes and they've actually done brilliantly again here today. So they're a group that you actually like uh, on the pitch when you watch them as a manager that you like. But there's that sort of bit of the final bit, the final third. Defensively, they're good. Midfield, they're good. But the final three, the front three players, they're good, the front three players, all of them, you know, the four or five, six they have in the squad but they just need that something else, that's something just to sort of light it up a little bit and they can get a couple of those types of players in. They could be a really, really top team. It is a jolt for Arsenal, this, isn't it? That's two yeah. defeats in a week now, uh, knocked out of the Carabao Cup by West Ham, losing for the first time in the Premier League this season. What, what are the things that Mikel Arteta has to address immediately, do you think? Not too much. You know, they defended really well. I mean, they lacked Erdegaard, they lacked some guile in the final third and they'll want to deal with that. I've said this after a few Arsenal games this season that I've done where I felt as though I'm watching Jesus at centre-forward or I'm watching Enketia at centre-forward and they're both very good. But I'd like them to be my number two and three striker. I'd really love them to be my number two and three striker and they might even end up playing wide sort of off the left in certain games or off the right because both of them I think can do that role but if they had a number nine a top number nine and they've had some real top number nines in the last 20 30 years Arsenal I think they would be yeah they'll be right up, well they will be right up there anyway but I think they could go on and win the title I think I've, I've nominated them to win the title and predicted them to win the title but when I look at them now the more in big games I see them I just feel like they're lacking something up top and to be fair, I think Mikel Arteta knows that. I think he loves them both, and he should do. Arsenal fans should do. This is not a criticism of the two lads they've got, because I think they can be really important players for Arsenal. Um, but I feel like they should be part of the overall 20-man squad and that they should contribute, play 25, 30 matches a season. But I still think you need something more in those top ma in those big matches that just get you over the line. You know, Haaland does get City over the line quite a bit. Um, and I think that's where it could, you know, the difference could be in the end. So for me, that's that's the big thing. Um, they're very good defensively. I think very good as a back four. I mean, I think they defended quite well today. I mean, Newcastle didn't have a shot on goal for I think 50, 60 minutes. So you, you couldn't really have a go at them defensively. I think that in midfield, could they be a bit more creative? Havertz. I'm not going to plough into Havertz because the reality of it is he's obviously settling into being an Arsenal player, but. You'd like to think that he could have stepped into that role of Odegaard today and just sort of created a moment or a goal. So for me, that's the one thing I would say. Maybe you'd look at the centre forward and then if Odegaard's not playing, just Havertz, is Havertz good enough to be able to be that creative player? So, you know, there's work to do. I, 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 they've, they've lost a game. You can lose a game up here against Newcastle. There'll be many teams lose here against Newcastle. So if you're going to lose a game, I think you, I, I'd say that's an acceptable way to lose a football match. You know, they'll be disappointed and they'll be gutted tonight and the Arsenal fans will be gutted with a long trip back. But I wouldn't say that there was a shame in this performance at all. It was a real big struggle of a game and they just got edged out by a goal in the end. Now, that can happen in football. And there's no, I'm not looking at any more than that. Do you think Havertz's first-half challenge might have been born from the frustration of his difficult start at Arsenal? The fact he's, he's desperate to make an impression, almost too desperate? Well, it's interesting when you talk about Havertz. There was a graphic came up that said he had the most pressures in the game, wasn't there? He had 23 pressures. When he's out of possession, and even the challenge that he makes down here, 
he runs with real force and purpose. I wish he ran with the same force and purpose into the box when Arsenal were in wide positions with Martelli and Saka, or they're pulling it back, or the you know I wish there was that real aggression and force in his run to get into the box to be a goal scorer. You know he's six foot two, whatever he is, he's he's huge on the he's a big presence. So can he get in there and sort of put it into the back of the net with his head? Can he fly across the near post and slide in? And he's quite languid, and sort of quite sort of floaty in his attacking work. And that's not a bad thing because you want composure on the ball. But I'd really like to see him show that force into his runs into the box and across the near post and into the back post potentially to be an aerial threat. Like he did on that one where he flew into the touchline onto the challenge there. That, that That's the force I'd like to see. And he's, he's, he's quite languid and sort of just like that. And I just feel like, there's, come on, you know, come on, I want something from you. And that's how I feel when I watch him a little bit. Um, so yeah, that that's my view of him. But like you say, you know, there's a big expectation on him. He's been bought for a big amount of money. Arsenal fans are questioning why they spent that money on him, why they've not gone got someone else, and I can see why. And that pressure's not going to go away from him. And he does need to do better. Let's be clear, he definitely needs to do better. Um, but for me, he didn't play badly today. You know, I thought he would be taken off because of the fact that he was treading the fine line with his yellow card, and thought any time he could have been sent off. But actually, Mikel Arteta left him on. So for me, that was a I think a good thing, but I think Mikel Arteta left him on thinking, go on, go and do it for me. I'm giving you a chance here. Go and do it for me. Go and make that moment. But he doesn't really either know how to go and get that goal when you need it or you know, the runs to make. I think he needs coaching on the runs to make across the near post or into the back post and off that strike. He should be that second striker, really, off Enketia. And he, he doesn't really play like that. He never runs past the centre forward. He never dribbles past the centre forward. He always sort of plays, sort of, if you like, the other side. So... I feel like he can do a lot more and he needs to do a lot more for Arsenal. And to be fair to him, he didn't have much to feed off in terms of set pieces today, did he? Because one of the things that we've always complimented on uh, Arsenal is their set pieces, but especially towards the end, they were a real oh, letdown today. I was driving me crazy. I mean, the set piece coach down here, he's, he used to do Medin as well, but he was, like, he was screaming on like crazy, like he was the manager. I'm not sure that helps. He's screaming on at, at Trossard, who's taking the, uh, the set pieces. Sit down. He knows what to do. You've, told, you've gone through it in the week. It's up on the board in the dressing room before the game. And you told him three, four times. And it just put, to me, it felt like he was putting more pressure on Trossard taking the corners, which, to be fair, Trossard didn't handle because his corners were appalling. And they were real chances. In the game that's so tight, set pieces, no one needs to tell Mikel Arteta or any of the coaches in this league. They're the sort of vital moments. And Arsenal are good on corners. They've got one, a good record. So just the delivery's got to be good. If the delivery isn't good, it all falls over. And I just felt as though he was being screamed at down this near side by the set-piece coach. And to be fair, he was probably putting pressure on him unnecessarily. You know, you want to go to take a set-piece in a dead ball, you want to be relaxed. You want to feel like you can sort of, you know, it's not easy taking a, a corner. I mean, people might say it's the easiest thing in the world to take a corner. Honestly, it's not easy to take a corner. If you're good at them, it looks really easy. But honestly, as a right-back, I couldn't have taken corners. And I could cross a ball. But to actually get it into the right areas all the time with precision, that's not an easy thing to do. So actually making sure the players are relaxed before you take them is an important thing. And I don't think that helped. Elsewhere today, the, the other disappointment for Arsenal, bearing in mind their own defeat, was how convincing and emphatic Manchester City were, scoring six, and Haaland didn't even get one of them. No, and to be fair, we were sort of seeing it, weren't we? I had like a split screen um, on the monitor we have here and we were sort of seeing the City goals go in and I think Arsenal are, are mature enough now to write that game off and know that they're not going to be helped today, that City are going to win against Bournemouth. But obviously it was emphatic and the goal difference means that it's you know quite a bit in front. But it swings and roundabouts and Arsenal, I think, uh, went through the sort of the middle last year in the sort of title race. I think it could suit them a little bit that their sort of pressure's been taken off them at this stage in the season. You know, if there were three, four points in front now, people would be building that pressure. Here we go, they've got to do it. I actually think it's not a bad thing for them just to stay in there. Now, they can't fall behind and they can't start to be seven or eight points behind. So they've got to make sure they stay in touch. But there's no doubt I think they can play better. They can get better. They can certainly be better in their attacking play. But it isn't the end of the world for them to be where they are and just stay in touch with things. And at the moment, Tottenham are getting a lot of the plaudits. Liverpool obviously Manchester City so they're in that pack and it's not a bad place for them to be they can't lose too many games and today I thought it was a game that you could lose in any season um, so they'll have to get back on in, in, back into winning ways um, 
but you're right, City were emphatic and City are going to win that game. They are going to win that game and they're not going to let you off too much. So Arsenal wouldn't have expected it. We should uh, have a word for Sheffield United. First win of the season for them today. Yeah. So uh, nice to see them notch up, notch up a victory against Wolves. Yeah, it was. And obviously we saw Burnley losing, but Sheffield United, the celebrations at the end and the excitement on the players' faces is fantastic. We don't want to see teams getting battered and sort of, if you like, just right at the bottom of the league, becoming cut off from the rest. That's not what we want. We want a competitive Premier League and clubs that come up from the Championship We've got to try and make them competitive when they come up. And uh, Burnley and Sheffield United were starting to look very desperate. And it's still difficult, but at least there was a win today, which is a, a nice moment for the, for the manager and for also the players. We saw Norwood at the end, didn't we? Who was celebrating like crazy on our screens in front of us. And so to the other United, closer to your heart. Um, what, what do you take from the Fulham game today? Do you take the character of a late victory or do you reflect on what wasn't another fantastic performance? <sighs> Look, they won. I think, to be fair, you re the relief we saw on the end at the end on the coaches' faces was enormous. The pressure was really ramping up, um, and another manager was starting to struggle right in front of our eyes, and still is struggling from a performance point of view. I mean, Manchester United did not play well at all today, but Fulham have struggled in front of goal themselves this season, and that was evident. So they were helped by that. I think they'll just be really happy that they give themselves a little bit of. I suppose, respite for the next three days. They've been under attack, and rightly so. I mean, the performances are woeful. Um, and every time they play a team that's down there or in the bottom half of the table, they can, they can with moments like Bruno Fernandes is today, they can win games. But it's a massive struggle. You know, they shouldn't be that bad to win football matches, and they have been that bad when even when they've won football matches this season. So maybe it's a time just to sort of reflect upon that. How did they get their players back? They've obviously got Casemiro out. They've got Martinez out. They've got, uh, who else did they have out today? Luke Shaw's obviously been out for a long time. Rashford was missing today. So they have got some players missing. There's no doubt about that, which will you know, make a big improvement when they come back. But they've got to get better. You know, we've seen other teams with players missing. And you know, Newcastle have got lots of players missing. And you see a different level of performance, a different intensity. You don't see that intensity from Manchester United. So they're well off it still. And it's not a time to start celebrating. But it was a nice moment for them in a difficult week. And I think that they'll feel a lot better about themselves. And, you know, they've obviously got a Copenhagen and Luton game, which are as friendly fixtures as you're going to get, let's be clear, um, going into an international break. And if they can win those two games, then they'll go into the international break with a little bit more confidence. There's always so much noise around Manchester United, of course, and, and people were scenting blood as far as Eric Ten Hag is concerned. So uh, a couple of issues. Marcus Rashford, we, we gather, was injured today. For you, did he, go, did he do anything wrong when he went out on the, uh, the day of the, the Manchester derby, despite the defeat and despite apparently not breaking club rules? <laughs> so, so, look, I mean, I, I said this in my book. I've said it openly and publicly. If we lost a match, any match, forget Manchester Derby. I mean, Manchester Derby, we wouldn't be seen for a week, two weeks. But if we lost a match, night outs were cancelled. Simple as that. that. That was my rule. It was the other lads' rule in the dressing room. You, you could not be seen out in a public place if you'd lost a football match. Because, to be fair, you would bump into people who've paid big money to go and watch the club, to watch the team play. And they don't want to see you really enjoying yourselves and celebrating. It's an optics thing. So... I'm all for lads enjoying the lives and getting on with the lives, but maybe that's just a night to sort of, if you like, have a takeaway, maybe have a glass of wine, bring your friends round to your house. Just optically, it's not obviously great, I don't think, if you're basically seen out in a nightclub in Manchester after a derby loss. I don't think it's right. I mean, Eric Ten Hag said it was a mistake. I would class it as a mistake as well. You know, Marcus is from Manchester. I know it was his birthday and you've got to live, but it's a Manchester derby. You've just been beaten 3-0. And the reality of it is the fans don't want to hear that you're out on the on the town. Now, I don't suspect he was drinking copious amounts of alcohol or anything like that. But also, Manchester United had a game on the Wednesday night against Newcastle in the Carabao Cup. And that's, again, a game three days later. So, again, is it the best thing for you to be out after a game when you've obviously got a game three days later? Probably not. So, on a couple of fronts, I would probably say that Marcus, in a different sort of what would be moment, would reflect upon that and say, no, I'm not going to do that again. Um... And look, I've played with lads who've done that, and I may have even done it myself at a certain point, maybe. I can't think when, but I don't, I don't think I did it for United. 
but I maybe did it with England when we went out after, a, you know, if we went out of a tournament, we'd go and have a drink that night, but it would be within the team hotel. In fact, I never did that, actually, so I, I, I'm, I'm correcting myself <laughs> because I wouldn't do. You know, I remember after the show on Go to Derby, um, cancelling my night out and sitting at home and having two or three beers and drowning my sorrows and basically sort of reflecting upon one of the worst professional days I'd had. You, you just don't go out after a derby. So for me, I'm not having a massive go. I'm not sort of sticking the knife into anybody here. I'm just saying I just don't think it's the wisest decision. If you want to keep the hassle away from your life, if you want to keep the media scrutiny away, if you want to have a peace, more peaceful life, as peaceful as you can at Manchester United at the moment, you've just got to make sensible decisions and not ask for trouble. And I think, to be fair, going to China White, which, to be fair, is about 100 yards from where I live, so you should have invited me, by the way. <laughs> I'd have come round and popped out. Um, you know, I, I generally think that would have been sort of the wisest thing just to stay in. Has he done something ridiculously wrong? No. But I think it's probably not the best thing to do. OK, and just finally on Manchester United, um, I heard the Super Sunday debate last week about your wishes for um, the new investment. And there have been reports this week that uh, Jim Radcliffe would put £245 million into improving the infrastructure of the ground and the training ground. Does that ease any of your concerns on that front? I think, yeah, I don't know how that leaks out. It's such a specific number, and I don't think it's helpful that the fans hear it and we hear it in sort of what would be piecemeal sort of fashion. Um, what we need to hear is the full proposal and how it's going to work. I mean, you don't sit here as a Manchester United fan wholly impressed by the idea of £245 million going in to improve the stadium, because we know that Barcelona and Real Madrid have had to spend a billion to get their stadiums right and for, for a full refit. And we know that other clubs have spent significantly more. So we know that's not going to actually touch the sides probably of a full refurb of Old Trafford. But what it is, is a significant amount of money. And Jim Ratcliffe is a smart, um, successful businessman that's not just going to, if you like, put £245 million into something and let it run down the drain. So I suspect it's probably the first instalment of a plan probably some sort of plan that means that they'll phase the actual refurbishment of the stadium over maybe two or three different sort of seasons or something like that where they'll do one stand or two stands with that first bit and then they'll do the second part and then they'll do a third part so it sounds to me like they're going to do it in sort of what would be phases which can happen you know I mean at the end of the day if they haven't got a billion quid and why would he put that level of money in if he's a minority shareholder but if he's putting some money in and at least it might deal with some of the issues that exist within the stadium. I know people sort of, it's become a bit of a sarcastic sort of throwaway comment, uh, you know, when Manchester United lose a game, well, oh, the Glazer family must have been playing centre-half or well, it's the leaking roof that cost us. But you don't go into successful clothes shops or hairdressers or petrol stations or banks with leaking roofs. A leaking roof is really clear evidence that it's a business that's not being invested in a business that's not being looked after and that to be fair is failing you know whichever way you look at it if you go into you know i don't see any thing that i you know supermarkets that i walk i don't see roofs leaking but manchester united football club one of the biggest football clubs and best football clubs in the world has a leaking roof and we think it's funny it becomes a joke but it's actually the clearest evidence that you can actually point towards other than the lack of success on the pitch that tells you that this is a failing administration and a failing leadership it is you know you just take it into your own life and think about when you walk into any old shop or you're going to a restaurant or a bar if there's a leaking roof you'd say i'm not going here again it's a fact so we i know we joke about it but they're really serious things these i take great pride in that stadium that stadium's been my life you know when i look up i look over it and i see that the, the actual paint's rusting and that they've not sort of painted it properly and that, it's, that the roof's leaking and that the concourses are so tired and that the hospitality is way behind everywhere else and that the fan experience outside is to be fair probably the worst in the league i genuinely honestly sort of w wince inside so th obviously there's a lot to do at manchester united and jim ratcliffe in his 25 percent isn't going to be able to fix everything at day one that's quite clear but what I would hope is that he's able to communicate a clear plan. And it was be clear that, obviously, the football side of things is the most important thing and first-team performance. That needs to be dealt with first. That'll make everybody feel better about themselves. Then the facilities do need to be fixed so everyone can feel pride in the stadium again and that we don't end up going from being one of the best stadiums in the world, selected for Champions League finals and European tournaments at the highest level in final stages, like semi-final stages, to not being selected in 2028 for a major tournament. 
know, that, that's where we're at at this moment in time. So Manchester United fans are patient. But I think when Jim Ratcliffe comes in, and I suspect it's going to be quite quickly if news like that's leaking around the 245 million, because they're very specific things. And you never know with the Glazer family, they might take the time and sort of dilly-dally around for the next eight months, ten months. But I'd like to think it's going to happen quickly, this. Because I think they need money. They, they, they desperately need investment. I mean, they're maxed out. They owe £300 million to other football clubs, which is the most in, of any club in the Premier League. It's the most that Manchester United have ever owed to other football clubs. They've got £800 million worth of debt. They really are struggling. They've maxed out in all sort of forms of their sort of finances. And it's a precarious position and they need some investment in. And obviously they want to take some money out themselves. So that's fine. So I would hope that Jim Ratcliffe at this moment in time is within those sort of what would be documents that he'll be negotiating to take control of the club, that he gains as much power as he possibly can in the control and running of the club so that we can see significant change. And if £245 million is the start of an investment into the stadium, and into, into the training ground, I think the fans will probably go with that as long as they know the next 245 and the next 245 is coming so that we end up with the stadium like the refurbished Bernabeu or the refurbished New Camp or the new Tottenham Stadium because that's where Manchester United fans' head will be. You know, one of the best clubs in the world should have one of the best stadiums in the world. Because one of the other discussion points was that he might take over the football running side of the club and it would be separated from the commercial side. But, but are those two things separable within a football club? He, he shouldn't do that. I mean, he won't do that. He's not just going to think that basically one department, he's looking at an important department, the football side, but he will have to impact the culture of the whole club and the feeling in the whole club. He'll have to touch every point in the club because the reality of it is the people that are in the club, there's five, six, seven hundred employees or there were when I left when I left ten years ago. And maybe hundred and fifty of them or two hundred of them are in the football side. The other five hundred he has to impact as well. Because he's to be fair, if he goes into the football club, he's the most experienced and most knowledgeable and most successful business person that there is or will be in that boardroom. So the idea now is what that he almost needs to make gla the Glazers almost passive investors, even though they'll own the majority, uh, or certainly a higher number than he will. He needs to make them passive in terms of control. Absolutely, I would take as much off them as possible. You know, the commercial side of the club will be successful with Jim Ratcliffe, as it would be successful. I mean, Glazer family have been quite successful on the on the commercial side, but Jim Ratcliffe will make it su uh, commercially successful as well. But he'll need to make sure that every single person feels good about going into work every day. That's really important. It's the most important thing. People are everything in your businesses, and to be fair, he'll know that he's one of the most successful businessmen in the world he can't just think that I'm going to touch 10-15% of the employees and leave the other 60-70% to sort of fend for themselves under the Glazer, stew Glazer stewardship that, that won't work and he knows that so I think I'm hoping that he's negotiating to take over what would be as much power and control as possible as he possibly can and fixing as many things as he possibly can so the Glazers, so the Glazers can't wriggle on him obviously when he gets through the door well, we'll see what uh, lies ahead if uh, confirmation of his investment happens in the next few days, weeks, months. But for now, thanks for joining us on the Thank Gary you. Neville podcast. Thank you.